Given that my next interview will be actually having a guest interviewer, being Jason Augustus Newcomb, uh, who I've recently interviewed and had a fabulous time with, and he has asked to interview me about the Order of Celtic Mysteries and the work of Yeats. Um, I've been, as some of you know, I took his Enochian Magic Master class, a uh, seven-day program, and have just been halfway through the Goetia one, which is both both are outstanding, and uh, honestly, everyone should just do them because you're going to get such a wide range of perspective and information that it can't do anything but inform you greater on your own studies, whatever system or tradition you are most inclined to pursue. So, uh, <laughs> actually, I got distracted uh, trying to get through one of his uh, lessons because we started messaging and we <laughs> messaged for a couple hours um, just about a wide range of topics that we'll also try to cover when he interviews me next on Monday, I believe, about Celtic Mysteries and a whole bunch of other subjects that we touched on. Hopefully, we'll get to all of them. Uh, the great thing about talking with wonderful people um, and serious lifelong magicians and adepti is there's no end to the conversation to be had so <clears throat> it's a lot of fun and um, leading up to that I thought it would be appropriate to get a bit more into the Celtic mysteries as they are already published um, so that won't spoil anything for the development of the initiations which will be performed over the next five years by a group of whomever wants to join. You can check it out at orderofcelticmysteries.com. Chapter 1, Introduction, from the dissertation by Lucy Shepard Caligura. As Richard Elmond, Elmond pointed out as early as 1948, to trace the development of W.B. Yeats's poetry is to trace the development of modern verse and, to some extent, of modern man. The truth of the latter part of that statement has been emphasized by the paradoxical mixture of rationalism and romanticism which has characterized the mid-seventies, and which is in many ways an outgrowth of current nostalgia for what is now thought to have been a simpler, more innocent time. This study, of course, was done in 1977 as a PhD dissertation. In moving from the pre-war Beloud glades of the early Yeats, through the intense psychological austerity of Byzantium to the raucous reconciliation of yin and yang and crazy Jane, one can indeed trace the psychic progress of 20th century man. <laughs> Increasingly, as the importance of Yeats's philosophical development is being recognized, scholars are trying to arrive at an understanding of the part played in this progress by the occult. Not so long ago, the poet's interest in the arcane was ridiculed or simply ignored. Note, W. H. Auden, for example, found Yeats's interest in the occult, quote-unquote, Southern Californian. James Hall and Martin Steinman, in their introduction to the permanence of Yeats, have called Yeats's status as a major poet embarrassing. Harold Bloom's major study, Yeats, virtually ignores the significant aspect of the poet's life and work. Now, however... As hitherto unpublished documents are brought to light and the obscurity of secrecy imposed by order vows is cleared, the long-term influence of the many rituals, patterns of thought, and philosophical assumptions of Yeats's occult orders is becoming more evident. Work in this area was first done by Elman, whose Yeats' The Man in the Masks, 1948, was among the earliest of the full-scale studies to grant the importance of esoteric knowledge in Yeats's work without delving into it very deeply. T. R. Hen's The Lonely Tower, 1949, devoted a chapter to myth and magic. In 1954, Virginia Moore's important biography, The Unicorn, concentrated much more intently on the Golden Dawn and Celtic materials than had been had earlier works. In an unpublished dissertation, 1973, Lawrence Fennelly explored the impact on Yeats's prose fiction of his friendship with the great occultist and magician S. L. McGregor Mathers. Most recently, George Mills Harper's Yeats's Golden Dawn has achieved a complete chronology of Yeats's activities, necessarily cloaked in secrecy at that time, during the height of his association with the Golden Dawn and his work 
on the Celtic mysteries. Further, but far less scholarly research has recently been presented on the wide-ranging influence of both McGregor Mathers and his wife, Moyna, on Yeats and his circle. This study will deal with the limited but significant part of Yeats' total occult experience known variously as the Celtic Mysteries, the Castle of Heroes Project, Druidism, or the Irish Mystical Order. So these are all the different names that uh, came and went during this period. Since his youth, Yeats had been in revolt against the rationalism of his age, quote, which assumed that the external and material were the only fixed things and only standards of reality. Convinced that another world of passion and spirit did indeed exist and determined to discover access to it, Yeats became a member of a succession of occult organizations. In 1886, he attended his first seance. In 1887, he joined Helena Petrovna Blavatsky's Theosophical Society and soon became a member of the Inner Esoteric Section. You can read about that sort of stuff in Yeats's own book, Autobiographies. In 1890, he joined the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and at the urging of Mathers and soon advanced to the Inner Order. Again, you can see reference in autobiographies. In the Celtic Mysteries, which were in part a direct outgrowth of his Golden Dawn activities, Yeats sought to bring together into the enter one enterprise several separate strands of his life. I want to go back and make a reference to the secrecy being an uh, issue. So there's two views uh, generally on the secrecy. One was it was necessary for the time, such as it was necessary to be secret if you were homosexual because you would end up in jail like Oscar Wilde did. So that's my theory is that's why uh, Mathers and Moyna uh, had their marriage arrangement, if you know what I mean. But the other view, and, and that would mean that the modern orders don't really need the same kind of secrecy. Some orders today believe that the secrecy, because it is part of the vow, is part of something that should never be changed and should always be followed to the letter. But there is division in the in the mainstream Golden Dawn world about this subject, so that's something worth noting. The uh, last argument that has been made is that it's not actually a secret order, despite a clause in the vow that might lead you to think so, but it's rather an order with secrets. While the Golden Dawn satisfied his need for ritual and ceremony, it failed as a way to bring him closer to Maud Gon, the woman he loved but could never win. In the Celtic Mysteries, Yeats hoped to create a specifically Irish esoteric visionary society in which he and Maud would be united in a mystical marriage of Mage and Sybil. If it sounds like a, a guy uh, was creating a magical order just to win his true love or spend time with the girl he was into, that's not entirely wrong. In evoking visions with her, he said that he discovered that she had come to have need of me, as it seemed, and I had no doubt that need would become love, that it was already coming so. It's from his memoirs. <laughs> that sounds like a, a young poet, poet to me in his 20s. Consequently, when Yeats discovered Castle Rock in Loch Key, he thought he had found a place where he and Maud could create an Irish Eleusis, or Samothrace, thereby fulfilling with mystical rites, quote, a ritual system of evocation and meditation, an obsession for which he had described as being more constant than anything but my love itself. He sought through the combined seerships of Maud and himself to create rituals which would be the work of invisible hands drawing from the collective folk memory of the race latent in the personal unconscious of them both. He was certain he would win Maud for himself in this way, even as he and she initiated young men and women into, wor into a worship, quote, which would unite the radical truths of Christianity to those of a more ancient world, using Castle Rock for their occasional retirement from the world. But occult religion, Maud Gon and Irish nationalism, were not the only stimuli for the Celtic mysteries. In them, Yeats hoped to find new symbols for literature, as he believed that folklore and myth created from the same racial memory from which his rituals would be drawn were the keys to all great literature, expressing the content and character of the soul rather than merely the intellect. In a review of Fiona MacLeod's From the Hills of Dream, 1896, Yeats stated, Emotions which seem vague or extravagant, 
when expressed under the influence of modern literature, cease to be vague and extravagant when associated with ancient legend and mythology. For legend and mythology were born out of man's longing for the mysterious and the infinite. Yeats certainly could not have felt that art should be a criticism of life. Rather, it should be a revelation of the unseen life, the super or surreal life. Mere realism could not evoke passion, but folk art could. As Yeats said in an essay on the Celtic element in literature, 1897, all folk literature has indeed a passion whose life is not in modern literature and music and art, except where it has come by some straight or crooked way out of ancient times. Yeats was especially interested in proving uh, the universality of Celtic traits as they are revealed in Celtic mythology. It's always worth remembering that the Celtic myths are not alone in their stories. They connect with many other myths as if they're from some pre-civilization or shared memory of humanity. I also think we should um, remember that there are six uh, Celtic myth traditions, uh, three Gaelic, the Welsh or the three Gaelic ones, the Irish, Scottish, and Manx from the Isle of Man, and the three Brythonic ones uh, in Wales, uh, Cornwall, and Breton, Brittany. Could it be, as Frain suggests, that with Irish, Welsh, Scottish, and, as Yeats hoped, Breton, Celtin, Celticism in full Renaissance, the Saxon Empire of realism and materialism might be encircled and destroyed? Perhaps. At any rate, it is clear that for Yeats, Celtic mythology was far superior to all others. In the same essay quoted above, Yeats noted that, quote, literature dwindles to a mere chronicle of circumstances or passionless fantasies and passionless meditations unless it is constantly flooded with the passions and beliefs of ancient times and that of all the fountains of the passions and beliefs of ancient times in Europe, the Slavonic, the Finnish, the Scandinavian, and the Celtic, the Celtic alone has been for centuries close to the main river of European literature. It has again and again brought the vivifying spirit of excess into the arts of Europe. That's from his, Yeats's book, uh, Explorations and Introductions. It's an interesting point that it definitely does have a cor close source to the river of European literature. It's worth remembering that the the Celtic of the Celtic languages, the oldest is uh, Irish, Old Irish, which would have uh, originally been create, uh, drawn from OM and cre or created OM. Uh, I'm not an expert on Old Irish, but it is also Irish is the third oldest language in the Western world. Greek, then Latin, and then Latin Latinized Irish. Um, this is something that is not disputed in the history of linguistics or uh, philology. Um, so Irish. A Gaelic is a very, very, or Gwelga, as it's actually called, Gwelga, is a, is a very, very old language, and it does represent this tradition where uh, Roman Christians came to the Celtic lands and met the Druids, and it was one of the most easy adaptations of Christianity. Sure, there was lots of violence and, and bloodshed, as always, but it was not so much uh, a struggle to for the Druids and the Celtic peoples to integrate Christianity. It was a much smoother process, and as a result, we see um, early Christian documents, I believe from the 5th century, the, the Synod of Lambeth or something like that, where you, you see this whole Celtic spirituality really blossom in a vibrant way in the very early Christian stages of development. And from it, we get the Book of Kells, one of the most beautiful illustrated manuscripts of the Gospels, and a whole wealth of other literature that didn't really struggle with its pagan druidic antecedents. It just sort of engaged them, combined them, to the extent that when I was living on the Aran Islands, modern day musician guys would drag me to altars of Mary and say, Hey, you got your rosary, pray to the Virgin goddess, Mary, pray and invoke the goddess of the fairies, the Virgin queen, our Holy Virgin Mary. It's like just a blend of this sort of language without question to them. The idea that these things would be separate, it, it never even, it never crosses their mind. It's just gods and fairies and angels and saints. It's all the same thing. It's all part of nature. That is the real beauty of what we call Celtic spirituality in general. He goes on to say that Dante, Shakespeare, Spencer, and others owed much to Celtic mythology, and that the holy grail of Arthurian legends seemed the cauldron of an Irish god. 
it's interesting that the Roger Parasus lecture uh, from the early 80s recently only just released um, by McLean on, on YouTube talks about uh, Yeats's involvement with A.E. Waite and Pamela Coleman Smith and how the Rider Waite tarot deck is actually drawn from a Welsh version of the Parsifal tale, so the Grail Mysteries, and that A.E. Waite's book on the Holy Order of the Grail or whatever is actually an outline of the tarot as opposed to uh, uh, an outline for an order or mythology. That is the argument uh, made by Parasus, who was the archivist for Anna Yates of Yates's papers from the 60s onwards and studied for that lecture for over several decades. Um, he's all, he was also the general secretary of the Theosophical Society of Ireland, so an interesting scholar with a lot of good source material who's worth listening to. You can find that lecture on our Order of Celtic Mysteries website or just on YouTube. Furthermore, Yeats saw the Celtic movement as opening new fountains of inspiration for the symbolist movement in Europe, which was in reaction against 18th century rationalism and 19th century materialism, and which was seeking to create a new sacred book. These arts must utter themselves through legends, and whereas all other legends tell of strange and familiar lands, quote, the Irish legends must move along, the Irish legends move among known woods and seas, and have so much of a new beauty that they may well give the opening century its most memorable symbols. The study of Celtic mythology, therefore, had many advantages to recommend it. In fact, uh, McGregor Mathers was considering using Celtic god forms at one point instead of Egyptian ones in the Golden Dawn. One, which is actually proof that the curriculum of the GD was never at a fixed point at any stage. So one of my qualms with traditionalist orders is they say we just do the traditionalist. Well, do you mean before 1900, how it was at the schism, how Estella Matutina or Alpha Omega was after that? Or do you mean at some distinct point before 1900 at which you have decided that this was the traditional official order? That's all, in my opinion, uh, an argumentation that falls more under the line of dogmatism rather than traditionalism, and I think I think that's a pretty sound argument. Um, I'm a big fan of any traditionalist order or dogmatic order uh, or preservers of ancient things. I think is a beautiful thing. However, I'm also a fan of development and progress, and I believe you could argue that the the Gondon and most mystery schools were fans of progress and meeting the needs of the people at the time and place where they are in. Um, that is what you might call also the, the hermeneutic project of human understanding. Anyway, the study of Celtic mythology therefore had many advantages. One, it was still close to the minds and imaginations of the people. George Polexfin, Yeats's maternal uncle and helper in the mysteries, employed a second-sighted servant, Mary Battle, great last name, who is said to have seen Queen Maeve herself riding from Nakanakara to Clunabar, as Yeats's poem The Hosting of the She records. Another contributor, George Russell, A.E., constantly saw visions from old Irish mythology. Secondly, Irish mythology had been halted in its literary development by numerous foreign invasions, not the least of which had been the British. And while the British had all but destroyed Gaelic culture, the substance of it was yet present in suspended animation, as it were in the Irish race and remembrance. And my own, my own great-grandfather was beaten any time he spoke Irish in school, Irish Gaelic in school, for sure. And uh, that's why they left in 1915 from Dublin. Thirdly, anything nationalistic had the potential to bring him closer to his own dark angel, Maud. And lastly, Celtic mythology had strong ritualistic associations, which could be used for literature, religion, and the divining of occult truths. Yeats devoted in all about 12 years to the study of specifically Irish myth, 1889 to 1900. About six of those years, 1895 to 1900, were devoted to intensive participation in the single and group visions which led to the creation of the Celtic Mysteries rituals. Clearly, the Celtic Mysteries, though ultimately abortive, were not mere passing fancy. And Yeats did, in fact, continue the study and development of them after the 1900s with Mathers and Moyna um, while they were in France. So that's something most people don't realize 
worth highlighting. While most major studies of Yeats have mentioned the Celtic mysteries, some at length and some quoting briefly from the unpublished papers from the Yeats Library and the National Get Library in Dublin, these drafts of rites, records of visionary seances, and occult notes have never been published in full. Transcribed from the manuscripts and typescripts, they appear with notes and commentary for the first time in this study. And that is the end of chapter one. Dr. Caligura's Yeats's Celtic Mysteries, 1977 dissertation. Continue to part two.